Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Talking Dirty, a, well, talking about dirt track racing, racing in general, and we got here, uh, what's your name again? No, Jason Ingles, right? IRP Race Cars, and uh, Patrick, Patrick Daniel. Patrick Daniel, and uh, you, you are a, a race car driver, kind of, I think? Yeah, I ride around in there and wear a helmet, it's about what happens. Okay, okay, so... Uh, Basically, we're just going to take this show and kind of do some topics, talk about them in the world of racing. And uh, first one we got here is skills versus deals. And it's basically talking about talent versus money in the racing world. When I go out and talk to these people about racing and, and everything in general, uh, you know, I bring up stock. Well, you've heard of, when I, you talk about racing, you heard of stock car or NASCAR, you'll say. And they'll be like, yeah. And I was like, so you've heard of Larson? No. So you've heard of uh, uh, Martin Truex? No, so you've heard of, they don't know any of these NASCAR drivers anymore. And that's what's ultimately killing them. We were talking about characters earlier. They don't have anyone that no one knows. Because back in the day, drivers used to come up on this local scene that we were talking about where everyone was known. You know, everybody used to know who this guy was in Dallas or in Georgia or Atlanta or, or, or wherever you're coming from. Dell Sr. came up out there uh, outside of Charlotte. You know, they gained a name there. They had a big old fan base before they even went and tried stock car racing you know but when they were 30 you yeah. know drivers got there at 30 when they had already built a fan base from 19 to 29 so they don't have these fan bases anymore the most popular driver in stock car racing that everyone knew knew is lightning mcqueen you know i've asked for years how do, how do some of these guys that couldn't drive a duck to water you know they still manage to keep their Cup rides, you know, they're, they're NASCAR rides. And I'm like, they can't even drive to the grocery store. They're terrible. <laughs> right, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And they have managed to get TV time and, and, and sell TV time, and they've managed to get in connection with the right people and the right sponsors. So, you know, if I if I go to Hendrix and say, hey, man, I've got $8 million. I, I realize it takes $16 million to run a successful cup team, but I'm going to give you eight. Will you just give me some of the scrub cars in the back and a few engines and let me ride around the And back. that's how a lot of those sub uh, yeah. cup, team, cup teams actually do stay in existence. They're tied in like that. Yeah. They give them half price for old used stuff. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and if you're a car owner, it's like, well, if I really cut down the nuts and bolts, I can give this cat, you know, the, the scrub equipment. I can take $2 million off the top, put in my pocket, or contribute to the, to the good cars who are going to make me more money, and I can let this guy ride around and do his thing. And, advertise a little bit or you could be a team owner who goes and does that deal. yeah for sure and then you sell nascar dreams to hopefuls and you make bank and say oh yeah come on five million a year there's, ten million a year there's no way that that deal makes sense you you take you know some of the greatest guys that have ever i don't care who it is the greatest nascar guys ever have all had some sort of dirt experience at one time or another. And I'm talking about the great greats. You're talking about Petty. You're talking about Earnhardt. You're talking about uh, Stewart. You know what I'm saying? You, you start naming off the for real deal badasses of the thing, and they all have dirt in their background coming up somewhere. Now, there's been some good pavement racers come out, don't get me wrong, but the elite group all came from dirt. You know, I look back to racers, and Jeff Gordon is probably one of the biggest disappointments of – coming from dirt but having nothing to do with it when you after know later oh i later think after he made he this. was he was playing the part you, you gotta understand jeff gordon i think he's gonna <coughs> set the stage jeff gordon the jeff yeah. gordon set the stage and he had to stay in in nascar to put it on that next level to where guys only aspired to be that yeah he didn't want to give the credit to dirt because dirt was threatening that's when the six, slick 50 series was taking off dirt was getting big in like 94. It was on. It was TNN, ESPN. He had to help kill that. Way back when, these teams didn't want a young driver to go out and party and be a straight run and fuck up. They needed somebody that was going to show up and race and not get in trouble, had a little family or somebody to support that was going to be fairly level-headed, not get in any trouble outside of the racetrack. You know what I mean? Well, this Gordon comes in and sets the world on fire as a young guy, and it just took everybody that was 30 and older, they just went... <laughs> If you're not at least 20 exactly. or younger, we're not yeah. even going to give you the time of day. Well, and, and I think somewhat my point has always been here recently is even those guys, they weren't necessarily the greatest drivers. They're just the greatest 
representation that stock car racing has to say here's our greatest yeah like tony stewart was beaten several times on dirt by guys it's not like he was the best and just destroyed everybody you know richard petty probably couldn't have jumped in a sprint car and beat ginzer or right. or dell senior couldn't have probably gotten a late model and beat scott bloomquist or billy moyer right. you know so they're great race car drivers in their division and, and the background sure does help uh but you know that's another thing to go with this talent versus money deal it's like you know People compare Kinzer to, you know, and all these guys who tried the stock car stuff out and didn't really do that great. And, you know, today you have more like simulation stuff that you can get into and, you know, know a random track and not ever be there. You know, the younger kids have access to now. You could turn 500,000 laps at a cup track and know every little bump, where to lift, where to break. And those guys back in those days had no opportunity to even try that stuff out. They're just going to Atlanta. It's the first time they've ever seen, seen the track before. That's right. You know, so, I mean, that made a big, big difference. But I think guys back then, like, why did Scott Bloomquist or Billy Moyer not go to stock cars back in the 80s? They didn't have to. They were making money in dirt track racing, you know, and, and that's what they had an opportunity to do. And I think in today's world, uh, you have a big issue, like you were saying, with uh, you know drivers not getting opportunities, getting subpar equipment, stuff like that. It's all about making money for them. It's more so they're like a big, almost a big Hollywood where they're selling these uh, make the show type of dreams, you know. And it's not necessarily who has the mo most talent; it's who has the most connections and who has the most money. And and it's very similar to you know a celebrity it, it world you know, that you see. Uh, Talladega Nights is kind of a silly movie, we all agree, but the one thing that they did touch on that is very accurate, in my opinion, when Ricky Bobby gets in his car for the first time and goes out there and is doing the driver interview, he's terrible, and the young kid says, God, Dad, he's terrible in his interview. Look at him, he's just a dumb cowboy. Well, that's there's a lot of truth to that. Some of these guys that have bukus of driving talent are terrible in front of the camera. They don't have any education. They don't speak well. They lock up. They're not groomable. They want to do whatever the flip they want to do. But that's also a problem because stock car racing, NASCAR racing was built on characters. And when you have all these puppets in front of cameras and they have no personality, you, got it. you know, one of the reasons people liked a guy like Sammy Swindell is because he was, he didn't talk much. Yeah. You know, he was in a little attitude. Look you at know? John Force, man. That's one of the most flamboyant, emotional. That dude may flip the table over and throw a wrench and you may find him crying after he wins. That I love that guy. His, his emotions, whatever is on his face, that's how he feels right there. Right. And that's a character. Yeah. You have the characters who are great and front of a camera but i also believe you have characters that aren't great in front of a camera yep. the ones who are silent the ones who don't have too much to say you know a john wayne style character you yep. know he doesn't say much but he talks on the track you know that's where he does his talking so our next topic is big fish little pond this is talking about the local talent versus the national talent uh in dirt track racing and in general racing as well uh, you can even go to the top, you know, big fishes in a little pond. I would call, you know, stock car racing a little pond. I had a guy uh, outside here run to me talking about the sippy cup video where I'm talking about, you know, you only have 40 guys you got to beat. And in dirt racing, you got thousands. Sure, you can be a big fish in a little pond up there in a way. And, you know, there's evidence, you know, I talk about some of these stock car guys coming to races on dirt and, uh, a lot of people bring up the prelude to the dream. You know, that was the last time you actually saw late models or dirt racing on ESPN, and it wasn't someone getting killed or hurt. And that was the prelude to the dream. Not the actual dream where the good race car drivers are, but the, the prelude to the dream. And they used the Kyle Busch one or the prelude one year. And there's a video on YouTube, we actually have a clip of it, where Kyle Busch goes to run a dirt late model race at a weekly event in Williams Grove, or at Williams Grove Speedway, and he, he's in hot laps getting dusted. I mean, th th some regular weekly guy is just out driving, you know, in my opinion, Kyle Busch is the best from asphalt racing. He grew up in the asphalt realms, kind of, you know, did a little yeah. dirt, but he is the best pure asphalt talent, I think, that's out there right Amen. now. And we got some, like I said, video of a little weekly guy, you know, late model <coughs> with probably half the money in the car, just destroying somebody like that and you even see that on our dirt levels you know there's a weekly guy that is just as talented as some of the national ones how many times but, you've been passed by somebody and the body <laughs> panels are flopping and the oh, wheels are different colors and it's like a porta can with wheels when it drove by me and That's, i was like what the hell happened? we're all gonna get beat sometime or another but i i guarantee you put kyle bush in a late model enough you know you give him a season in and he'd be out there 
he's a true talent that would be out there rising to the top. He'd be out, but do you think he'd be dominating everybody and destroying the whole league? I don't it's, think so. I think for, our dirt guys are just as good as dirt, him. Our dirt guys are just as good as him, you know, in their element. Um, you know, he's proven himself to be on the, you know, the asphalt side of it, the NASCAR side. I mean, he's proven himself to be one of the best. But on the other hand, you know, I, I think he'd be he'd be a contender, you know, because he's definitely got the talent behind the wheel. But exactly, and all I'm saying is that he's a great race. Like I said, the best they got. I'm not saying he's not going to be that great, but I am saying is there's no logistical system for him to be up there beating these guys who may not even be the best drivers. There is no high score of college, so how do you know that those guys up there are even the best? They just are the ones with – the best money and opportunity and talent and people that they know to even be at that level. You get them on the dirt tracks where you can work your way onto the track and get your own car put together out there. That may be where the LeBron Jameses and Tom Brady's of racing actually are. The, the greatest talents in the world who didn't have a high school or a college to go to and get drafted into this imaginary world of racing. They might be out here on here on these dirt tracks and the locals are just as good. You know, I, I, there was a, one guy who made a post to a few months ago about if there was uh, outlaw drivers, uh, sprint car outlaw racers, racing 305s weekly, he'd be there every week. And I'm thinking to myself, but our local 305 guys are running these cars as hard as you can run them. Yeah. They don't have $150,000 for 410 sprint car for maybe a race or $5 million to go run a season with those guys. But they're just as, they're running these 305s as hard as you can run them. If you put Donnie Shots out there or one of those outlaw guys, they may not be winning every week. I'll tell you something else that affects our, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but it affects your driving mentality a, a, a little bit. A guy that wants to race and do it a lot, you know, if you're racing on a budget where most of those guys that you mentioned don't have a budget, you're going to drive that race car just a little bit different because if you knock a front clip off or if you bend something, you got to go to work and work every day, set out a week or two before you got the money to repair it. You know, if you got three or four of them hanging on the wall, we well, drive that thing a little bit different. You know what I'm saying? Right. That's just like me. <coughs> when I when I first started racing, I didn't even have a spare set of tires. So I'll be damned if I was going to go out there in the heat racing just annihilate the tires I had. But now that I've got another set mounted in the trailer, well, if it takes burning the right rear completely off, brand new, and I run it one race, and that's it, to win that heat race to qualify me better for the feature, ain't no problem. But if a guy that's beside me doesn't have that luxury, he may not race his shit as hard even though he's just as good or better because he ain't got the extra parts. But then you're also saying that guy with the parts flopping off has drove by both of you before. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's what I'm talking so about, talent racing, versus money. Yeah. I mean, you can racing have that. is humbling and very deceiving, man, for sure. You can have that luxury of having the extra tire, but the guy with the stuff that ain't got the extra tire can still blow by you sometimes. For sure. It's stressful going to, you know, back in the day when you had to make enough money to get home on, and we did it. We've all done it at some point in our younger days. You got to know that you got to finish to make enough money to get back home. And and it, you know a lot of that can be stressful on a driver and make him make you know different decisions on the racetrack. Sometimes you back off, and sometimes the stress gets to you, and you you just got to be a strong person to get over it. Definitely. And and like I said, I I just think that there are some local talents that have the budget to only be running locally at some of these tracks or regionally. That are some of the greatest talents in America. They just don't have the budget to go run uh, a big national series. You see that with Indiana Midget Week. You see a lot of people, you know, as I call Keith Coons Motorsports, the talent agency for stock car racing. You see all the stock car guys who eventually get there. If they're from dirt, that's where they go. They're like the selling dreams, you know, $300,000 a year rent, rent a rides basically. And that's how you have all these issues out there where guys are getting flipped and stuff. Some mom or dad's been sold this dream. My kid can make it to the top. I paid 300 grand. You get out there and you drive it like you're. You have to make. You have to make it. So go out there and door a guy if you have to. Throw a slider from 10 car lengths back. That's stupid and retarded. Because I paid 300 grand. You got to make it to the top. You know these guys are pressured, and uh, it's just something that's a little difficult. And I just think we got some local talents who are nationally, are, are good enough to be on a national level. It's just their budget, whatever it may be. They're not able to get to that level, and they sometimes get pushed to the wayside even by our own dirt community as a subpar talent, like the guy who would come out to a 305 sprint car race every week if there was outlaw drivers out there, you know. But there's guys out there running those 305 sprint cars that he won't come out and watch because they're not outlaw guys yeah, when they're I just as good, if, yeah, if not no, as talented. It doesn't have the name with it, yeah. I think that goes to, uh, you know, I think racing's very talent based. 
A lot of people think that it's stupid and easy, you know, regular people that yeah. don't know of it. You know, and that's another reason I didn't really like Talladega Nights, because that stupid and easy opinion, yeah. Yeah. extremely, you know, times by, yeah, yeah, amplified it hugely, because <laughs> it made it look even more dumb and more easy, when right. people already thought it was stupid <clears> and dumb. <throat> but it's one of the most, uh, I, I, it's right up there with golf, or, or throwing, or pitching a baseball, or hitting a sure. baseball, as far as a hand-eye coordination, you know, and... Uh, I think, you know, like you said, the people who may not have got a shot, they might be the best because it's, it's really talent-based. I think people need to understand that. A lot of people don't understand how really talent-based. And that's why I say, you know, the local guys could be just as good. I think you got a lot of Johnny Manziel's up there on the top level of racing right now looking good because there's no Tom Brady to go up again. For sure. You know, the, uh, and you look at it, these guys just ain't getting chances. You know, Tim Tebow prayed to God to throw a football. Really good, hit the guy going across the middle. He prayed for it, practiced it every day. But Tom Brady can just walk out there, you know, have a shot in one hand and laughing at Tebow and, and nail a guy around the money, drop it right over to finish shoulder. Yeah. It's just a natural talent to drive these race cars. All right, so now we're gonna go to those days versus these days. What is making it in racing? Of course, back in the day, you could make it in racing, running sprint cars, late models. You could make a name for yourself in, in the racing world to the general public, you know. You, Local racing was in newspapers, was news uh, scenes were coming out covering the sport. Uh, and same thing applied to Trans Am racing. Uh, different forms were pushed to the public. Today, seems like the only way you become famous in racing is if you go up and get a, a stock car ride. So what do you think about the differences between those two segments? Is it something that we need to get back to where more than one type of motorsports gets that fame or notoriety in a I national think, spotlight? I think nowadays, you know, the racing is, you know, set to the wayside because of TV, TV, TV footage. Um, you know, everybody looks at their phones now. They don't look at TV. You know, you go home Don't with you your think families. that helps us, though? Because we're able I to put more stuff on the phones than we're ever going to be able to put on TV, obviously. That's a double-edged in, sword. You know, in a sense, it helps us, but you know, you know, you go home and look at your family. You, I look at my kids, and they're they're on their phones. They ain't even watching TV no more. Whereas, at least on the TV, you'd see commercials. You know, as growing up as a kid, we'd see the commercials of, you know, uh, Dale Earnhardt on Chevrolet commercials. You know, we'd see we'd get to watch the uh, races on TV, and and we always you know look forward to watching it. Now you can sit back and record it. We fast forward through the commercials. Heck, heck, half the time I fast forward till I see a yellow flag, and I go back and see what's happening, or if I see a, a good race going on. But um, well, phones ain't really hurt the attendance or attention to other sports in the world, though. I mean, football, well, yeah. basketball, baseball, NHL's yeah. actually grown. I mean, I think that's the easy scapegoat. I think that it's not really uh, – you're not producing it to people. People don't have an option of what racing is right now. We're all race fans in this, and a lot of people who are watching this are because we like dirt track racing. We like sprint cars, late models, you know, exciting racing. You know, that's the <coughs> truth of the matter. Is stock car racing's never really been that exciting. It, it, it used to be with your little – what, the Ernie Irvin wreck or whatever it was? Yeah. That, or what was it? Was it Irvin that – or Davey Allison? Or, uh, yeah, you had it. Yeah. yeah. What well, was it? Allison and Yarborough. And Donnie uh, Allison and, yeah. and Yarborough. Sorry, Ir Irvin yeah. ended up driving that car yeah. later on down uh, the road. You're talking about Kyle Petty no, and Davey I'm thinking, Davey I'm Allison. thinking, I'm thinking yes, of Kenny Irwin Jr. who ended up yeah. driving that car down the road. Yeah, but, but that was uh, this is the Coca-Cola 600 one year when they, turned, when they crossed the finish line upside down. Yeah. But that race – that particular race was um, ran differently. Like they they basically ran it on a Saturday night, literally, and they ran it like a Saturday night short track show. They literally had two heat races and then come back and inverted the field and then ran a third race, and the third one was the one that paid all the money. So that because of that, it was a sellout crowd. I mean, some of that stuff I don't understand why they don't why they well, changed, and but. I think that stock car racing made a big mistake from getting away from North Wilkesboro, getting away from For Rockingham. Sure. Were those race cars actually put on a show? Those were exciting. You know, those yep. were good races. But my more so point was in today's world, I mean, what it is, I probably wouldn't be a race fan if all I could watch was stock cars and I didn't know about the start stuff. I think the problem is a lot of people in the regular general society, they only have one option to view racing. That's all they're shown. You know, they're not shown sprint cars on ESPN or, or late models or any of this exciting motorsports. 
unlike back in the day, it was ESPN Speed World where there Remember was the sprint cars. Thursday Night Thunder. Go right. Home yeah. and watch, you know, they used to be shown. Out to go home and watch Thursday Night Thunder. And you know, and the, and, but regular people used to see this stuff too, so they had options in the menu of racing. Now they only have really one and maybe an IndyCar race every now and then. The only IndyCar race that matters anymore is the Indy 500. Everything else don't matter. Right. You know, so I mean, I just think that if more people, because when you show them sprint cars, like when I go and talk to people and I show them a sprint car sideways and our, or our badass, you know, race or late models, it's like, whoa, what the hell is that? You know, even when Prelude to the Dream was on ESPN, the commentator was like, oh, it looks like Tokyo Drift. Yeah. I mean, they have no idea. He's like, that's cool, but they have no idea that it even exists. Yeah. I think there's got to be a different approach. You know, you, you mentioned that attendance sank down in football and all that. I disagree because they're not having sellout crowds everywhere. You know, depends on the team. It does depend on the team and later its success. In the, later if in the, if the season, team's having success, they're, they're, they do have good attendance rates. I mean, you know, everything can be watched – from home, but you know, I think there's got to be a different approach, you know, nowadays versus what what it was 15, 20 years ago, you know, on it. And I think you know what we're doing here maybe may be a different approach. You know, we we catch people on you know Facebook, social media, stuff like that. So you know, maybe help out. Yeah. I hope what do you so. think about the fame? You remember those days back then when uh, dirt racing made money? Yeah. You, know, you can make a living. There Bloomquist a- Bloomquist didn't have to go get in a truck. You know, yeah. Sammy Swindell. Nobody ran up to him. You know, Sammy Swindell was 14 years old setting track records. Nobody ran up to him and said, you got to get in a truck or you're not going to matter. Right. No one did that. He could go and be a dirt track star, make a living and make a way, you know, become famous in, in that way. Those guys got invited to IROC back you know, then because they were known. I think some of the problem, and I, I mean, you know, you're kind of beating a dead horse here, but like my dad raced economy late models and stock cars and modifies the stuff same as his dad did back then and I'm sure his dad's got some of the same stuff when well, you go back to like 1984 um, when my dad was in his, in his heyday and you look he's got pay envelopes and newspaper clippings and all this stuff and he told me he had about $4,800 in his car bumper to bumper race ready and he had the baddest son of a bitch you could build and he did most of it himself and four or five of his buddies come over at night and they worked on it and helped and this that and the other well I think they raced like 21 times and he won like 16 of them that year and if you if you back then they paid heat race money mm-hmm. and they paid trophy dash money which we don't run trophy dashes anymore and then they paid a main money and if you won all three races in your division that night a it was a hundred bonus. yeah it was a sweep bonus and at times you could even opt to go to the back if you were eligible for that sweep and double your bonus if you wanted the main event off the back. Well, shit, he'd leave there with four or five hundred bucks. And in 1984, a guy made five hundred bucks a week was cutting fat off an ass. And that's back. And when he was I, making this. You know, he was making this on the weekends racing. And that's when a new truck was like five grand. Yeah. So, We're talking about a new truck being five grand. You're winning five hundred. So if your new truck out there is ninety grand, you should literally be racing for about six grand. For sure. Right now, on yeah. a weekly basis. The debt to income ratio is so far out around. I talk to people all the time that are like, "Oh man, that looks like so much fun," but I can't do it and couldn't afford it, and so just we shun everything. I'm telling you, I'm, and I agree with Jason on some of this. Technology is killing racing. Because used to, a guy was a half-ass fabricator and a half-ass race car driver was going to be something special every Saturday night. Now, you don't have to know. You don't have to fabricate or build anything. I mean, I, I still, you just buy the speed. I, I still disagree because, I mean, it's like I've heard the notion there's so many things to do on a Saturday night. You're not even a thing. To, people just don't even know we I exist. I agree with that, That too. is the yeah. biggest problem. I agree. They don't know we exist. And if they hear about us, well, your best guy is running stock cars. Your right. Batman isn't here anymore. We send him off, you yeah. know. We call them out. I, I don't disagree with your with so you that's saying That's the that at all. biggest. I think that's the biggest problem, well, and I think that goes back to those days being covered by mainstream media. And these days, you don't see a you don't see our cars on a TV screen unless somebody's dying. Yeah, it's just simply because of the money, in my opinion. And then another thing that well, there's that, a lot of monopolies that, that do play a part. Scares people away is these cars are so technologically advanced that people don't give you credit for. There's so much going on underneath a regular Saturday Night Modified that when somebody looks underneath of it, it blows their mind and they don't want any part of it. And at times I feel that way. I'm like, shit, I don't even know what to do. It's, like you, you know, said, it's humbling. One night you're the hero, the next night you're back there in 15th and you're trying to figure out what you did wrong. And yeah. It's, it's just There's just insane. so many options and so many shock and spring <coughs> combinations. And, well, this, this week, this guy's got the hot ticket on shocks. This guy's got the good pull bar this week that's out. So you're constantly having to buy and spend and this and that. Just try shit, you know. And here's another thing. Maybe great for that guy, 
And you may bolt it on your car, be the same exact parts and equipment, and you may suck. It just doesn't fit your driving style for whatever reason. That's why they sell different grips on a golf club. Well, everybody's hand don't, don't you fit think them for, the same. Don't you, know? you think right. for all that money and all that work and all that talent, somebody should know that you even are out there? Oh, that'd be nice, yeah. Patrick Daniel, I'm out there. So now we're uh, moving over into the Bloom Question. And it's Bloom Quist just took the uh, dream. Amazing show uh, display. Of course, Saturday night had some issues. Wasn't the track had to come through a heat on the, the final day. Made it. Uh, I think he started 15th, wasn't it? And was to the lead within 40 laps. I think took the lead and never looked back. One by nine seconds, I think it was. Yeah. Talk about that uh, showing that uh, the zero put on. It's amazing, you know, to look at his career from way back as far as I can remember. You know, it's you know you always see one driver that seems to be on top for a couple of years, and and but he's always been there. He might fall off for a short time, but he always gets it right back. And the man's 57 years old. Is that right? Something he's up there. He's, you know, and he's still doing it. Still one of the best. You know, I, you know, he don't he don't have a clue who I am, but boy, I sure well, you know I'm sure admire his uh, racing ability. Trying to and, get off the last and, topic, but nobody knows who he is in the regular world either. Yeah. Unless he goes out there and dies, you ain't gonna see his, him on ESPN. You know, yeah. so, knowledge I mean, and design and everything he puts behind it. He you know he puts a full effort behind it. And his his talent is just up there. Yeah, I'm sure it'll hurt some people's feelings. And you're feelings. a late model guy. So yeah, this when is... I say it, it'll hurt some people's feelings, but he's the best driver to ever set his ass in a dirt race car, period, across the board of all time. There may be somebody – now, there's a bunch of badasses out there, don't get me wrong, but he, he is the he, – that's it, man, he's the mark. And just because, like Jason said, it, he, this guy wasn't on top for five years, for ten years. He's been on top since the day he got in a car. I think he won a championship, like his second year he ever even did it. The first now time you were he telling won. me about the four wheeler with the gas tank, the innovation that he has. Yeah. Not just not just the actual driving part, but the staying up all yeah. night long, yeah. working on cars. Yeah, he'll he'll be the first one to tell you you're not going to outwork him. Period. It doesn't make shit. He ain't, he ain't going to have it. He will outwork you. And then the guy's got plenty of talent on, behind the steering wheel, and you couple that with the fact that he's a halfway engineer, apparently, you know, just the way his mind thinks uh, mechanically. I mean, he's 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 pretty impressive. I'm with Jason. There's he's, a lot of good racers out no there. No doubt. You can't take nothing away from them, but man, he's um, he's definitely you know for his era of of racing. I mean, he's definitely proved himself. Now, definitely. Davenport came along a few years ago and mm -hmm. challenged them, but wasn't Absolutely. there some engineering behind that, too? What's the story with Davenport when he got on that run? Man, uh, he got hooked up with a guy named Kevin Rumley, and he, worked, he was an engineer, uh, a for real deal mechanical engineer, and, and worked for one of the NASCAR teams. I'm not sure which one, but anyway, he had always kind of had a, a love for dirt racing, and he got hooked up with Davenport, and uh, he engineered some some pretty interesting stuff, from what I understand. They, they outlawed had, one of the they parts. They right? rewrite the rule book for him a <laughs> right. little bit, but you know that there's. Well, I go back to just technology and, and racing, you know. But way back when, on the late models, you know, these which guys are going to find a way to go fast. Don't get me wrong, but they sit there and you know you had one spring and one shock per corner of every car now they're triple stacking springs on the left rear like you got to have a machine that reads a machine to read your spring ratings so you even know what the hell you, you got you said that guy had a i think i think he was telling me he has like a chassis dyno or something that he built with the program he yes. made that you is yeah, only working down for rate. his deal yeah. or yeah he's um definitely definitely so there's a lot of brains that go into these late models sure. too. he rose to the top and he proved that you know Scott Bloomfield. All them guys could be be beat, but um, who won Saturday? It looked like Davenport was leading, yeah. and hey, Bloomquist drew Davenport's drove right one by. Him. Of, one of the best. He's too, a wheel but, man, no you know, doubt. You look at the time and years you know, invested. You know, and Davenport may be there, but he's um, but Scott Bloomquist has definitely proved himself for a lot of years. You know, yeah. Davenport, take nothing away from Davenport. And Jimmy Josh Owens Richards. had a good run for a little while. Yeah. Josh Richards. There's been a bunch of guys that have that have showed up, and they're not done yet. I'm not saying they are, but you just look back from 1980, whatever, when Scott started, till today. I mean, this dude, he just he's never gone away and stayed away. He's you know he's just relentlessly finds himself in the hunt all the time, especially in the money races. He won one of them races last year, I think it was, and in, in his interview, he's like, he's. Or maybe the year before last, and he's and he, one of the things he said kind of stuck with me. He said, "Just when you think you know technology has gotten as far as it can go, he said we always come up with something better to to make make us even faster, you know." And that's a 
he said, you know, right now you think there's nothing else I could do to be any faster. You go out and watch a late model race, it's impressive to see just how fast they are going right now and, and to look at where, where they were two, three years ago. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, the whole attitude of the cars are different. Back when his dad drove, and that's one thing you, you take from Scott, <clears throat> you know, when he first started driving, they were racing leaf spring cars when his, his first car was probably a leaf spring car, I would imagine. And, and those cars didn't move around. They didn't lift. They weren't rocked down on the right front headlight. I mean, they were just flat. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? So that guy not only has been good enough now, but he made the transition from all of this stuff the whole way. And it's, it's, he has always evolved with whatever's happened and maintained to stay on front. Somebody will get up there and give him a run for his money, but he just he, – he, he just the guy doesn't have any quit in him, he I don't, don't guess. Give up. <laughs> so what do you think – uh, is it just haters being haters on this whole drug deal that's going on? He got his name called, uh, couldn't go to the restroom, then all of a sudden got hurt, had to leave, and then Here's, came back the next day, did what he did. I mean, I don't think no drug can help you drive that car like he drove the car. Uh, but is that just haters being haters? Or I mean, obviously something was missed here. There was some test that was missed. That is something. But you know, that is, is that even something to be viable to be bringing up right now? Yeah, I, mean, I don't care if you're Scott Bloomquist or who you are, at any name at any point. The rule book is written, and everybody needs to abide by that. And it don't matter if it's me. It don't matter who it is. The rule book is written. If you can't abide by the rules, whether it's your car, whether it's you as a driver, I don't give a damn how good you are or what accomplishments you had or how many sta- how many people you're putting in the seat. If you can't abide by the rule book, then your ass needs to go to the house because here's why. I'm a biggest Scott Bloomquist fan as there is, but I ain't going to pay a fucking dime to show up and watch him alone roll around the racetrack by himself. And if you keep pissing people off and catering to one individual, whether it's him or anybody else, nobody's going to show up and watch one race car hot lap. So what do you think is the solution for this drug mistest accusation deal? He should have had to stay in there until... Until yeah. he could pass the test. Yeah. Or some pass so or too little, too late. Oh, you know, well, I, I mean, what, what do we do? I mean, test as soon I'm, as possible. Like I said, mean, I'm a biggest Scott Do you DQ fan him because he didn't, because he was called? I mean, apparently all the other ones who were called made, made the call except far him. As, I don't support drugs in any way. So as far as I'm concerned, if he walked out of the test, you know, he, he failed. You know, that don't take the way that, you know, take away that I, I think he's one of the greatest drivers ever. Does it take the win but, that happened the next day away? I, does it threaten should, that? Like, I mean, does it threaten should that? Should he have got the race? I don't know. That's uh, I mean, that's yeah. a decision they made. I don't I don't think so. If if all the rest of those guys in that field were made to take a drug test, he's no different than everybody else. Well, they randomly selected, I think it was 20-something drivers, and he was one of them. Yeah. So, well, what do you do? There needs to be... You don't, some, you don't take the win away, do you? There needs to be black and white consequence. I don't think you can now. You can't take the win away. Because, of course, he, he couldn't go to the restroom. He went away, got hurt, slipped, fell, Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, whatever, and had to leave emergency situation. So, I mean... You know, it, it's no different than if, than, if, than if I or him or whoever was cheating on their car. If I come out two weeks later and say, hey, man, I was running a bigger cubic inch motor than all the rest of y'all, and that's why you got that throw down ass whipping put on you, you can't take my win away. I mean, you might can on the Internet, but I still have the money's in the bank and the check's hanging on the wall. That's true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you can't take it away All you can do fact. is address it next time and make it concrete. It's, you know, in my eyes, you know, that it should have been addressed beforehand. For sure. I, I mean, I thought – he put a stellar performance there. He he won the race. Right, you and this is take, just coming out the next day. You can't take it away from him Monday, afterwards. You know, so, I mean, but yeah. if he couldn't take the drug test beforehand, he should have had to sit out. Yep. I, I mean, agree. I enjoyed watching that race, that performance he did, but, you know. But now, what do you do? It's just, you have to do just it. next time, make yeah. sure it's right? There's I mean, nothing you can do now. Hindsight's twenty twenty. You have to get it right <laughs> next time because if you don't, you don't have very many more choice and chances and then – because if the other 20 drivers go, hey, if you're not going to make him abide by the same rules that we are, we're loading mm-hmm. up and going home. That's going to be more drastic and effective than just sending him home. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So Patrick Daniels, the favorite topic, uh, open motors versus crate motors. And, uh, well, you got, uh, you got a crate motor right over there in your modified. Uh, you're so more uh, upset at the late model deal, I guess, or what? I, it, to me, it doesn't matter, man. I mean, the crate motor deal, I see what they were trying to do, and I see how it was 
it came about and what they were trying to accomplish. And on th in theory, on paper, it was great. But the problem is these tech guys take their flashlight and shine underneath the hood and, oh, it's a crate motor? They instantly don't tech shit on nothing. You know what I mean? That thing's good. Well, you're telling me that you can't go to and find a regular engine builder who's crate certified. If I pay him another $3,000, somebody out there has got will compromise their morals for enough money. And if they cheat my spec motor up, it's going to run a hell of a lot better than his. Right. And if they're not teching it, then it don't matter. And then the and engine now motor. I get all these brakes from being a little crate motor, but I'm putting out the same amount of horsepower open motors putting out, but I got all these extra advantages to run it. So my point is, what fires me up about the whole deal, you see these crate motors on the internet and they cost the same or more then you could go buy a brand new one from the GM house. How is that? This guy says, well, they got carburetor and pulleys. You're telling me that a wore out spec of crate motor is going to cost the same because you got a rat shit carburetor and a fan blade on it? No. Somebody's done something in there and tuned that up. Why does everybody want the same three or four crate motor guys to build their crate motors? You know what I'm saying? It ain't just, you know, I bought. I mean, when's the last time that one of these guys bought one from GM, just bolted it into frame rails of their car, and didn't do shit else to it, and went out there and strapped it on? Which somebody. is what it's meant to be. Is what it's that's meant what to it's be. meant to but be. But that's not what it is. And again, we're we are racers, and we want to go fast. You know what I'm saying? And they'll pay and, ten grand for five horsepower. Exactly. And see, even the motor builders, somewhat protected, say he does do something for three grand. It goes out there and gets popped. Oh well, the racer must have done something when it was in his shop. I used to kind of agree with you, but we went to Batesville last year to the 20,000 to win. And that's the first time I've run IMCA, first time I've run a crate motor. And I pulled out on the track, and I don't think one, I don't think there was one up front running crate motor that was any different than mine. I mean, you pull out there and you gas it beside them, and you feel like you're in a factory stock. Yeah. You know, but that same guy's beside you, and he's doing the same thing, you know, down the straightaway. It's the momentum that they make through the corners. Um, on the weekend racer, do I think maybe some of them's getting cheated up? I think there is a good are possibility. You, are you more so talking about the like the Neesmith style, the late model crate racing that's going on? Because just any of them that's sealed, you know what I'm saying? If they if they you're saying you be, don't trust their seal basically. When they start they letting, why are they paying ten more grand for nothing? Just a crate motor? What's you something right. up with that? Right. When they when they have too many different motor builders to to go in and repair them, you know I think. Um, quote i'm not for imca 100 percent. you know i think there's things i dislike about them uh things i like about them but i think they do monitor the the crate motors a lot better than some of the outside series oh i'm sure uh, when there's 10 or 20 different motor builders that can build it yeah you're gonna out of that percentage you're gonna have a, a bad batch that that will take that extra money and do it um i think there's a lot of corporate influence as well in the crate motor push because no look doubts. imagine how much money gm's made off of this deal and they're doing deals just like they did tire deals uh with certain uh sanctions i mean well, just, i know that, i mean um, i know this guy that bought a couple of crate motors from gm and they didn't they didn't run until the water got hot and he broke them and it wasn't anything he was doing i mean they were breaking like burning the rods up you know what i'm saying or breaking something major internally you go to take it back and they're like no nah, dude it's a race motor sorry <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And well, even motor, the tweaked motors, the tweaked motors still have to be bought from GM to be crate motors first. Yeah, and then for they sure. go. So, I mean, there's even where you have these motor builders building crate motors, they're still being bought from corporate GM. Then, once you see, like in the late model guys, when you know, um, I seen some of them, like you're talking about, posted for $12,000, there ain't no, no way, no how should that be right. You well, know? and another thing is, at $12,000, this crate deal is supposed to be saving me money. Now I got to have a twelve or thirteen thousand dollar crate motor to run up front. Yes. How's that saving me money? All you're doing is is screwing up my relationship with my engine builder and taking money out of some poor bastard who's got a shop like this trying to make a living building race car motors, you know, and making GM rich. I agree with you. It's still the money's going to be spent as a racer. You, it, unfortunately, the world runs on money. The one thing it does take away is you can't build an engine in your own shop, but that's kind of been taken away through the development of engineering yep, within technology. motor shops anyway. So, yeah. you know, it's, for sure. It's, it's the real world. You know, GM's doing their part to push them. You know, they pay the money. That's I mean, it's the way the world works. You know, money talks. 
Yeah, money. money what do you think money. about the race in between the two? Man, I don't. For me, here's the deal. Back when racing was in its heyday, your grandma's neighbor's grandma could go sit in the stands, and every time a new class of cars rolled out on that racetrack, she had never been to a dirt race, and she could tell you, that ain't the same shit I just watched five minutes ago. <laughs> but now true. that ain't the case. There's 15 different classes of modifieds. I'm just telling y'all, modifieds, another class of modified, is not going to save racing. Whether Even it's a <laughs> B, C, or D modified, it ain't going to save the deal, folks. Okay? It won't. <laughs> yeah. Only thing that's different is carburetor on this one, headers on that one, tires on this one, blah, 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 okay? If modified is your top tier end all be all class on Saturday night at your local racetrack, then why don't we by God sound like it? This, I went and watched the IMCA race here, me and my son, and they had all these crate motors in and these 6,800 chips or whatever, and they're running around there like grandma's station wagon. Okay, great. Maybe they're hauling ass and maybe they'll outrun an open motor, okay? But let me explain something to everybody watching. Perception is reality, okay? If you perceive it, that's how it is. So when I show up, I want to hear somebody turning 8,800 sounding like they're tearing the world down. And if you get 20 of them out there and I can hear them over the interstate traffic behind the racetrack, we got a hot rod here. And I'm going to stand <laughs> yeah. up to the fence and watch. But when you got these things that sound like somebody's... 84 or something. Yeah, 80, station, wagon. station wagon with a muffler cut off out there. Everybody's at the hot dog stand unless you got know somebody. And I'm not taking away from the lower class guys. You can hear the announcers better. My thing is, <laughs> when, when the real deal super late models or the real deal USMTS modifieds or something with a seven, eight, nine hundred horsepower motor rolls out on that racetrack and one of them boys throw their right foot down on the floor and crack the butterflies open in that bitch and it roars and sucks the dirt out of the air, it has a hold, it, it rumbles the ground and pounds you in your chest, now you've got some excitement. I want to stand right on the fence and watch if I'm not driving. And kids are so, good playing, yes, good sir. playing in the grass. Come watch. It so sounds not like even, T-Rex you, is tearing the world see, down. You see, as, you see crate motors not only as far as the money and the tricks that's going on, but also the performance. Yeah, just the perception of it. Your top class has got to kick ass and take names, and it's got to rumble the ground, whatever that is. I'm not saying the crate motors don't have a place. It's just not in your ultimate top-tier Saturday night class, whatever that is. Although I'm say modified, which would be considered a top class, is predominantly taken over right now by Crate Motors. Yep. Do you think that has a lot of corporate influence? Oh, for sure. Yeah, there's no doubt. Okay, so uh, that's the issue there. I already know the next topic. It's uh, billboards versus <laughs> boats, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I had a buddy of mine. He he always used to make fun of me because I like sprint cars. I'm kind of outnumbered here for sure. Uh, <laughs> And he, he called them billboards, and I always, you know, well, I didn't, but somebody else I knew who liked sprint cars called them boats. So sprint cars versus late models, almost, you know, these are wannabe late models now. They're not modifieds like the Northeast style modifieds. To me, that's kind of a whole nother animal in itself. Uh, well, you just got through talking about all you was talking about in the modified world. We don't have those problems in sprint car racing at all. I mean, you get behind the wheel and you drive them. What makes you like late mile racing so much over a sprint car race? For me, um, I feel like the, the, that the late models overall typically in more track conditions than not produce a better side-by-side -side racing. And sprint cars are so fast and so open-wheeled and so precision that if they touch, it's usually catastrophic and somebody ends up getting hurt or there's a lot of money spent i've seen good races where late models have been run over and both guys hit each other and run into the concrete fence and turn together collectively off of it and, and get separated and race again for another 10 laps and to me that's that's fun that you know they're they're still hauling ass but they have the the, the and my whole personality and whole nature just <clears throat> from day one has been like that. I just like that more aggressive style. Just, And I'm not saying that you, as a late model guy, you want to go in there and treat it like a hobby stock and, and mow somebody or down. Or like that B-Main from the dream when yeah. they're racing for that last transfer but spot. You, 
you have a little more room for air there, and it, to me it just adds a little more excitement when those guys are able to bump and grind a little bit. I don't know. I think with a sprint car you get you, you may not have as much side-by-side -side action, but you have a little bit more of a swarm-style action. The slide jobs back and forth, three and four wide, especially. I think track conditions play a factor. Like, for instance, this last weekend at Kilgore, the track was kind of slicked off one line. I'm telling you right now, if there was a 360 sprint car out there with the wing on, it can just do things a wing sprint car that is can do things that other cars can't yeah. you know it can run a higher line on a racetrack where other cars don't have that downforce or momentum to be able to do it to where you can pull off sliders to where the show is a little bit better it ain't always a freight train because there are some late mile races that get turned into freight train races That's whereas true. if there's a sprint car out there it has the wing to where it can actually run another line and become a better race also you don't have the technology as much like a late mile you can't you can't just go study your way to the front in a sprint car. I mean, there's only so much you can do. There's some bars, some shocks, tire pressures, a little bit here and there. You can't develop a bar and go to the front every race. You got to be a driver in a sprint car, I think, a little bit more than a late model because you can work your way mentally to the front with a late model with some trick. But with a sprint car, you got to be able to get it done yourself behind the wheel. And, I mean, it is a little bit more dangerous. I mean, it, it's open wheel so yeah. i mean you can't touch but that also makes it a little bit more difficult to be able to drive because you can't touch for sure those, so those guys are exciting no doubt you know the speed that they do is exciting but you know i'm i'm kind of diehard late model you know when you get out there watching them sprint cars a lot of times that fast guy is going to get to the front in two or three laps and then it's just everybody I, I don't know i mean out. i think it i think Where really late model guys they run long enough races that you know their track conditions change. You see one car back here in eighth place, all of a sudden he starts coming in, their tires, you know, tire conditions change. Uh, where sprint cars, that 30 laps ain't enough for me. I don't know. I mean, there's some 40 lap. I think the most exciting race in the world, really, as far as dirt, is a quarter mile to third mile slick track with sprint cars on it because you can get a swarm going like no other no other race i mean i guess it depends on what kind of do you like talladega or do you like rockingham you know talladega is going to be your side by side racing for a long period of time or do you like something like a rockingham if you're you know it's a nascar analogy where it's you more a little more driver you got to race past guys i don't know i i guess it would really depend on what do you like i guess that is also the glory of dirt track racing if you like a certain style you can find it. We got different cars, we got different drivers, different type of racing. A sprint car race is more like jets in a gymnasium, and a late mile race is more like a herd of freaking badasses, you know, out there getting it on side by side for as many laps. Which one do you like more? Do you like the quick, fast action, or do you like the little bit longer, drawn out, just as exciting races? Because I'm telling you, when I was at Timberline, and I, it's the first time I saw, uh, you know, a, a super late mile really on a hard rutted track when we were out there a few mm -hmm. months ago and they were you know tyler urban those guys were taking that late mile wide open in the corner and just slamming it and right back on the <laughs> throttle and that damn late mile was whoop, whoop, right you i was sitting there i'm like if that was a sprint car he would have just been off in the tree so sure. there. he would have flipped it out of the park but once again that's the technology working for that late mile that you don't have in a sprint car you got to drive to the front in a sprint car if you're going to be good you got to be on it in the wheel you can't really make something up at the shop to get you up front. I think that is one advantage that sprint car racing does have over late models. I think they need longer laps. You know, I'd much rather watch a 100-lap late model race and see those track conditions change, see those drivers, you know, you know, find different lines. And, and Well, that, I, I think that's a problem with sprint car racing. Short. They've went to the smaller gas tanks back in the heydays, as we talk about, you know, 30 gallon gas, the big the giant gas tanks back there used to put on bigger races. I don't want to watch 500 miles of nascar at one time you know unless they're on a little small track like, like richmond or somewhere but uh but i dang sure watch 100 laps of late model racing any day of the week the silver crown yes yeah, see that's crown. the deal with sprint cars winged or non-wing that's a whole nother fight we could have yeah. had a damn argument oh, over that right here sure. you know because it's a whole nother crowd and a, a non-wing sprint car is pretty similar to a a late model modified style race yeah. I, I just think that that wing sometimes that we were talking about here you know, like that Kilgore track, if there was wing sprint cars at that track, it wouldn't have been single file around the bottom, you know, because yeah. that wing can allow you to take that car to places that other cars can't. Just like that late mile with that suspension can take it through those ruts, like that sprint car would have flipped off in the trees. So right. it's an argument that, 
has been going on for a long time. I, you know, and I know that it sometimes like, depends on what you grew up in. It's as kind well. of like big titties or a big butt. Where where do you fall? Right, it's right. preference. Do you right. want both? I mean, yeah. hey, in dirt track <coughs> racing, hey, for those who don't know about it, we got both. We yeah. got we got both. We got sprint cars and late models. We're just right. talking about which one's better here. So, oh, we were talking about Facebook a little earlier, and Facebook does cause some stuff every now and then. And where was a uh, New rap got put on one of your new IRP <laughs> cars here recently, and it was a, a new car for you, right? Yeah, and, it's a new uh, car. Rap guys <laughs> messing with other rap guys? What happened here? What was the situation? Oh, I don't know. You know, you, there's always that social the media. The bar. I'm going to call it the bar. The bar. Um, raise the bar. Is um, it, this is setting the bar, I This believe. is setting the bar, yeah. <laughs> they, there's always a social media guy that's going to get on there and criticize something, you know, and, and they're – you know, they won some races with the new car and take nothing away from them. You know, every, you know they run good. They've done good, but they had a bar on their car that they seemed to think we had copied. Um, the truth is, people's put bars on their car for many years of racing. You know, I can remember them back into the late 90s. Um, you know, people put bolt-on braces. You know, all it is is cutting out a brace in your car where you can take it in and out of the car to where the chassis will flex. Um, you know. It got a lot of attention, I can say that. You got, I mean, I, y'all got <laughs> yeah. the attention. I mean, did you see the bar that he's talking about? Is, this is just old it's, technology, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's been around forever. It's very yeah. comical, you know, a, a guy wins some races on it, and he's a good racer, um, you know, but a guy wins some races on it, so so that bar is labeled to that car now, you know, where, you know, it's a greatest drive we can buy at any parts store, any racing parts store. You know, I'm sure. Um, I mean, yeah. and all of these modifieds, in my opinion, are copied off late model technology at the end of the day, ain't they? Some form, somewhere, you know, we all got four tires and wheels that we got to put a chassis around it. Uh, some way, somehow, you know, you could look at every car and there's some bar some put in there the same way. Compared. You know, you got to build a car and you got to make it to meet them four tires and wheels. So, um, you know, it's it, it's just funny how the how the general public and I say the general public, you know, you get a few guys out there that could relate it that way and think you're, you know, copying something they've worked hard to, hard to engineer. All I gotta say is, is does that bar, you know, lift or pull or what? Because last time I saw a clunch going a corner, it stayed wide open. It didn't lift. Spun that guy around at Greenville real, real easy, you know. So. I wasn't there. I don't, <laughs> hey, the video I'm, doesn't lie. I told you. So have I'm, you seen this bar? Talk about it. What, what, what's the deal? What's 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 the bar here? Man. That, I saw it and I've seen it, like Jason said, on guys' cars for years and years. And, and to me, in my opinion, and I think he could probably chime in on this, racing's almost like fashion. Stuff that used to happen 10 or 15 years ago will somehow cycle its way back. And one guy will put it on in the pit area and just start handing out ass whippings like candy at Halloween. And then next week, there's going to be four or five guys got the same whatever it was he did on their car. Well, it's something we changed up our chassis and, it, and we did take some bracing out to where we could bolt that in and out but, it seems to be the new trend nowadays where everybody wants their cars to flex um me personally i believe in keeping the car more rigid and letting the suspension do the work but you know the the market is wanting a car that flexes so that's what we're producing my point to all that is is the guy that added that bar the originally is the guy that came up with it the guy that just recycled it and and came up he didn't copy anybody you know what i'm right. saying like just because there was somebody in a different town or a different region than what he was or area and even jody davidson said like a 2012 western flyer yeah. had the same yeah. bar on there you can remember this guy well, i'm gonna mention jay blair back years ago he won a super series and he dominated that year yep. you looked at his car he had two or three of them bars you know through the right side of his car and i remember thinking you know, my GRT car didn't have that. We had, everybody had GRT late models back then. But he had that in his, and, and that dude was a wheel man. I mean, for a year or two years, you know, he, he dominated the Super Series. And he won the championship, and then I don't know whatever happened I to don't him. He kind of yeah, fell off just, the face. I mean, more than likely, even like uh, – Jay, the, if you're out there, just give us a like if you would, bud, or a little compliment or something. Sure. Yeah, we're talking about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, Talking good about you too now. It is – I don't think it's all necessarily the bars that's having these guys win races either. You know, somebody who like like Day who came down and won, who was in this conversation on on Facebook, 
He could have won the race without the stupid bar on there. You that know, same there's, guy. There's certain people that are just good. I'll add another note. That same guy won that Super Series. He, I mean, he was he was a good racer, you know, top of the line. He went and tried to run ARCA and didn't have the budget to do it. Back to the beginning of our, our show when we was talking about money, yeah. you know, it takes money. He went out there and he proved himself to be one of the best. He went out there and he couldn't even stay on the lead lap with them just because of well, the I, financial I, part of the it. The thing on asphalt is – we talk about money buying you work your way to the front on dirt on asphalt it does buy your way to the front talk about setup on asphalt that's yeah. everything yeah money horsepower all that is everything and the thing about asphalt racing and uh it's been verified through talking to some people is if you can't drive on dirt in a dirt car you might wreck you might hurt yourself you might flip if you can't drive on asphalt you just go slow around the track uh, you know, you, you may be, you're out there, Danica, you run 15 or 20. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're out there in a sprint car or, or a super late mile and you can't drive, you might hurt somebody. You might be Elliot Sadler in the prelude spinning out in hot laps because you don't know how to go straight. Yeah. You know, if you can't drive, it shows. For sure. You know, but if you go to ARCA, don't matter how talented you are on asphalt, that car is going to dictate how good you are. We talked about Jeff Gordon. His influence on the sport really did change a lot with this perspective of stock cars taking over the world of motorsports. And his T-Rex car was already, you know, after that race, it got disqualified from the series as illegal. I mean, how much did that guy have an advantage to, you know, live up to this golden boy, as he was, you know, nicknamed Rainbow Warrior guy. So, I mean, asphalt, as far as that guy goes, you go to ARCA, you go to any of these series, on asphalt, your car is what's winning a race more times than not. And Agreed. I'd say pretty much every, especially On in the asphalt, new. Agreed. Now at Rockingham, now at North Wilkesboro, Bristol. you put them on yeah. these racetracks. Now, see, guy made a good point to me about a month ago. He's like, you know why they don't race on those tracks anymore? I'm like, why? And he's like, because you can't control it. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, we were talking about the cinematics and now, you know, stock car race has been known to play for the cinematics to try to get the fans involved you can't control rockingham's race as much as you can daytona or talladega or even that 1.5 mile tracks now they're so aero aero efficient you know the two mile tracks michigan's you can you know with the rules with who's allowed and who's not you can get a guy up front you can get a guy running good whereas at rockingham or at north wilkesboro guy can drive his way to the front and Amen. mess up your plan yeah you know so and that may be a reason why dirt isn't on the mainstream level as much because you're not able to control dirt racing at all you can only put so much money in a sprint car or a late model you know guys can become a star if dirt was you know pushed the public based on what they want to do there's no organization that can really control who's the best now we're getting close to that with how the current situation in dirt is because now you have these hierarchy teams running the dirt scene right now that's who's running it you know world outlaw sprint cars didn't have to have one nascar driver owning a a dirt team to have a sprint car series right or late models or anything like that we're getting to the point if it keeps going down the road it is to where you will have enough powerhouse teams instilled into the top levels of dirt to where they're able now to control the situation on on the top levels of the dirt racing scene so I don't know. It's just still going to be hard to control the dirt because it's always changing. The you know the track conditions from track to track is always changing. It's still and maybe know, that's why those, it doesn't get the mainstream attention those, because it cannot be as orchestrated because you can't control that. There is those, guys who could spend you know regular guy who can spend the money and be up front. You can't do that with NASCAR. Those teams are going to be hard to beat. I agree with you. They're going to be hard to beat, but they can be beat a lot easier than they can on that. On right. You're not going to be able to go build a, a car ready for Daytona like Harry Hogg and, no. and go win a Daytona 500 right now. You need forty look, million dollars. Look, and, and look bel- at Jimmy Johnson. Look at his yeah, superstar career. Where it started after he got in Hendrix. Yeah. You know, he didn't have – take nothing away from him. And, and, he didn't have the ability to win much before then. But you put we, him in the right stuff. We talk won. about the influence of Gordon. I mean, how big was Hendrick until Gordon came along, Rick, Ray Evernham came along? Those, those guys crew ended chiefs up, make or break a lot I mean, of those guys. They, they ended up – I mean, and look what – I mean, even Del, even Earnhardt Sr., who had some fame beforehand, that battle with Crunchy him and Gordon sand, really yeah. shot that whole thing up, you yeah. know, so – it's interesting to, to think about for sure. All right, so our next topic is criticism knows. It's basically talking about the criticism of, uh, you know, tracks, drivers, series. I've been, you know, hated on for being critical of stock car. Hey, Mr. Stock Car, I want to first be the one to say thank you for being loyal to Goodyear. A lot of people don't know that Goodyear is actually one of the only American-owned tire producers. 
Hoosier is owned by Germany, which is well, Hoosier is owned by Continental, which is owned by Germany. And then uh, you know, a lot of people may say, well, what about that, Firestone? I, I knew they were. I knew that Hoosier had. Uh, I think I think he's right. I think it was Continental. Yeah, and, General, then, and then maybe. Firestone. I, you know, General might, Tire it, is owned. They're all under the Continental brand. Okay, Continental are is they? The main there you guy. go. I knew. So was, all the money, I knew there was a. You know, and I love Hoosiers. I'm just saying. You know, yeah. this may be why. You know, stop, Mr. Stock Car. You're being loyal to the American guy, which is Goodyear's out of Akron, Ohio. Yeah. LeBron James, the Akron Hammer. There so you go. No, I'm just playing, but uh, American Racer. That's the only two that actually come here. A Firestone's owned by Bridgestone, which is owned by Japan. So, I mean, you only have really two choices there, which American Racers on these. Oh, no, not there, but over there it is. You're covering up that one. Good job. No. But, uh, so, I mean, and then you had <coughs> Kenny Wallace come out uh, just recently, uh, and he made a video where he's talking about how he can make a post about a, a NASCAR topic and all these people comment and like, but he makes a post about dirt and, you know, nobody makes a comment or talking about it. And he's kind of, what he's saying there is almost kind of what I'm saying. You know, I've been talking, to, and he says, you know, he had he made this video, and people were bashing about, well, I don't like NASCAR, and he's like, that's not the point. The only reason I go out here and, and kind of do attack stock car land is because I'm trying to produce what he's saying, you know, push dirt as, a, a, as its own form. But at the same time, stock car racing has built this thing since Gordon to push this perspective that they have on the regular people. They're getting invited to the White House. Martin Truex Jr. is getting invited to the White House. The country literally believes that they are the professionals. They are the NBA, the NFL of racing. And they're not. Like, as much as they are on TV, as much as we know, we know they're guys, they're not the best. It goes they're, back to perception is reality. Exactly. And that's what I'm talking about. That's why I've been making these videos that I'm making. Y'all can all talk all you want. I don't care. This is the truth. When you go out to the regular people, they don't know about this dirt stuff. They know about this, though. They know about this NFL that they've heard about that's on their TV screens that gets the ma mainstream attention. And that's my criticism. That's the reason I go after them is, is to break this spell, I guess you would say, that they have on people that they are the best, that they are the pros, that there's some thing. I'm saying no. These dirt guys, you know, they didn't have no NFL. They, or, or they didn't have no high school. They didn't have no college. It wasn't no NFL. The, the Tom Brady's, LeBron James talents are out here on the dirt. And that's the only way we're going to get people back to these tracks. we got to raise the awareness and the respect. Because Americans don't come and watch Robin. There's never been one movie come out that says Robin and no one else. It's always Batman. For sure. So we got to be the best. You know, America only likes the best. That's just a simple fact. And right now, the truth of the matter is, there's no one out there that can say we're not the best, just as much there's no one out there who can say that they are the best. You know, that kind of uh, fits hand in hand with my shirt. It says if you want to be the man, you have to beat the man. <laughs> it does. And, 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 I mean, those guys up there, like the Kyle Busch video I had earlier of a weekly guy dusting them, they're not the best. That's the only you know, criticism that I have. And I think it's something that has to be addressed because people do know about those guys. And when you reference racing to regular people, that's what pops in their mind as racing, because that's what they've seen their own life. So I'm, you know, that's the only reason I'm critical. But other topics, as far as like tracks being people being critical on tracks, series drivers publicly on Facebook, what what do y'all view as that? Because a lot of people say it's destroying the sport, it's ruining it. I don't know. I think you sometimes have to be openly honest about something for anything to be fixed. And I think in life across the board, no matter what you're doing, whether you're dealing with a spouse, a coworker, a neighbor, whatever, your first line of action needs to be directly to them. You know what I'm saying? So if this racer, if this fan or whoever's on Facebook is just smashing the hell out of a series or a racetrack, if they've went to this track or this series multiple times and got blown off, I feel like there's a small amount of validity that those people need to be heard because at the end of the day racers are employees to the track and the series they're the entertainer yes they're, i mean they're pretty they're much the show they're pretty much the employees and if you don't take care of them I, I hate to do this but super is a prime example you know we begged and begged and begged as racers in, in the in the louisiana based super late model series to please cut our tires from five choices down to two. Yeah. And finally, after we went from 35 to 40 cars a night down to 17, oh, well, let's do that and see if we can help. Dude, I, I was not the only one hollering this. I get 
again, that's a money-driven deal. But it, 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 at the end of the day, as a series, you have to sit down and go, hey, what's our end goal? A racetrack, a, a business owner, a promoter, anybody. What is your end goal? Is my end goal to make as much money as I can, as quick as I can, to hell with the sport and everybody else just fill my pockets? Then you're going to run that differently. But if you want to maintain the integrity of your organization via track uh, or series or whatever, and you want to do that long term, you're going to have to run that differently. And you're going to have to listen to some feedback. And you're not going to make everybody happy. But when you got guys that won't come run your series because the rules, you have the only rule package like that, and you're part of the country exclusively, you are by yourself then when everyone else rains out around you and you don't pick up any cars, you need to ask yourself, am I doing the right thing here? Sometimes in life, if you can't beat them, you have to join them just to survive. And that, I mean, and, and to me, that Super Series is a prime example of that. They just hard-headed and wouldn't budge. So do you think budge, if somebody was on Facebook and now talking done. about that publicly, <laughs> that that would have embarrassed them to the, well, at that point, there wasn't really a they, Facebook to go bitch about. They heard about. it. You know, yes. it's, you know it's, they heard it, but... You know, like he you said. You hear a lot more so nowadays. The big Facebook issue is, or publicly critic criticism, is like uh, track conditions. You hear people trashing tracks most of the time. That seems there's, to be the bigger deal. You know, in life, there's like he was saying, in life, whether well, it's your job, your career, you know, all that. There's ways to approach things. You know, there's people. There's you can politely say, hey, you know, as, you know, kind of disappointed in the track, stuff like that. But to get on there and just totally bash them. You know, it's you know you wouldn't do that at your job. If you would, you know you're gonna be you're gonna be for down sure. the road looking for another job. Well, so what about what do you so. think about just critically talking about the sport, the drivers, the stars? I mean, we have this in every other sport. I just mentioned the Akron ha Hammer, LeBron James, and there's people who talk crap about him, and he's one of the best. You know, I I I think we do. You know, in in an entertainment perspective, need to have good guys and bad guys, or perspectives, or this this different perspective. I mean. Look at how, I mean, how soft are some of these new race car drivers that are out there or that are on top? You know, I made three little videos on Facebook and Larson's coming out of the woodworks, you know, bitching me out. You know, Sammy Swindell, I mean, and these guys don't even stand up for themselves no more. I mean, Swindell's in victory lane. You know, uh, I think Rico won that one year at the Chili Bowl, tries to tell Larson you don't like it, Keith Coons is in his face. And I make a little video about Chris Bell running over people at the shootout and his car owner's trying to kill me, you know. And the only guy who had any balls to say anything was, the lesser of the three, I don't even want to name him, but he had to be slightly intoxicated to say something to me. So, I mean, these guys can't even handle a little criticism. They're getting their hearts a little bitty broken. I mean, in, in every other sport, you got people saying Tom Brady's overrated, LeBron James. Can these guys even handle that stuff? I mean, why is that? Why do we have to be so communistic in a way? Because it's like you can't say that about that guy. That's just society you know, that's just as a not whole right. anymore. You can't say anything well, that offends I mean, anybody in society as You can. As a whole. I mean, there's people all day but, saying this stuff about Brady. They don't know about yeah, they should. The world people, of sports. You know I mean, what? We live in America. For, right. Goodness sakes. And, <laughs> you know, it's it. there are men and women, great, brave men and women, who have fought and died so that we can express how we right. feel and, without being I, I agree with you there for sure. Because so, – if so, I mean, there, I'm sure there's somebody going to talk smack about me. They go, you ain't going to please everybody. And you know what? I believe it's Scott Bloomquist said, if they ain't talking about you, they don't know about you. Yep. That's it. Right. Yeah. Talk about me. Well, I mean, I agree with you on that. that. That's what people died for. You know, when I was threatened, that's exactly what I said on the phone. I mean, there's men and women who died for my right to say what I have to feel. And if yep. you feel like you need to do something to me, then do it. You know, the greatest feeling in the world ain't you coming up and knocking me out because I said something. That, is, that ain't really that great. The greatest feeling in the world is getting up from the hospital and saying the same damn thing the next day. Yeah. You know, criticism is needed in motorsports because some people need the critical talk. You know, and we should just accept it. I don't think these guys... I mean, what would they really hand? Would they be able to handle a Dylan Hart Senior who would be critical in the lot in the Here, in the garage? Here's the thing, I you don't know. What agree about with. those? How would they handle a real racer that talks smack like a real man yeah. in the garage area? The one thing I don't agree with is if if a guy, me included, it pulls a bonehead move on the racetrack, then you need you know you can you can rough his, you can rough his feathers up a little bit and say, man, that that dude he he drove like a drunk third grader. That was, that was some of the worst driving I've seen him do. But so many times. We start to attack those people as individuals, and that has nothing to do with their personal life. Right. You know what I'm saying? I think the same thing 
keep it on the track. Same thing yeah. with the speech, keep it on yeah. the track. Because the then when you start going to girlfriends and, and wives, and yeah. I think that's where you're going down the road. Yeah, for sure. It, I mean, if you're if you're pissed because somebody doored you or run over you or the you know the racetracks you know didn't handle something right or made a bad call or whatever, um, you know, chances are you're not the only son of a bitch in the pit area that saw that that night. You know what I'm saying? Oh, so just don't have a your lot baby of... born and have a coke bottle there and celebrate it on Twitter. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> We've Keep all going. screwed up on the track. We've all, you know, been on the side of, you know, running over somebody. We've all been on the side of getting run over, you know. It's I don't think I've ever run over anybody. Oh, yeah. oh wow. <laughs> Never. <laughs> it's frustrating. Were you all racing this weekend? It's, we need to get y'all out It's there. frustrating, but, you know, there's a point where you carry things too far, you know, and I can, in the real world, I'll give a good example. Donald Trump supporters, Donald Trump haters. Them guys are carrying that stuff too far i mean there you can say your piece you don't agree with him you agree with him yeah just I mean, the news companies there's make a, a lot point. of money on there's fuel a point, that stuff there's too. a point where you go too far you know it's you know so do i agree with some criticism yes but when it goes on and on no you know it's and it's just and again you go straight you know if the racetrack made a bad call go to them say hey that was a bullshit deal behind closed doors if it happens again i'm not gonna come over here and race it's that simple and i've had that right i've had that talk with several guys you know i feel like i'm very fair at the end of the day i don't think that i deserve to win every race you know what i'm saying I don't, that's not possible but at the end of the day just like i was going back to earlier that rule book is written for a reason and it needs to be black and white and there doesn't need to be any gray areas and it needs to be the same rules for me it is for everybody else you know what i'm saying right and, and and i made like i said the one the way i'm fitting in here is is the criticism of the stock and i heard somebody came on there the other day and said there you are again all you are is being all about dirt and you know stop you're not being equal or fair i'm like wake the hell up right now the racing world isn't equal and fair like Life's i'm not the, equal and i mean fair. It, well yeah. i mean but no what i'm talking about in this racing world it, it, it's very easy to expose as it should be but it's not you know i'm just saying like people are saying i'm all about dirt not trying to be fair i think that what really needs to happen my criticism of the sport right now is that we need to start being represented individually as different forms of sport indy cars stock cars dirt all this other trans am needs to get back in the scene i mean tommy kendall was a big name we used to know who that was who's a big trans am guy right now i don't even know yeah we knew who tommy kendall was for sure you know we're, it's the the racing world is not fair right now i mean the racing world is is communistic that's the best way to put it. The racing world is a communistic system right now where the rich royalties are on top and everybody else just has to feed or suffer and, you know, not get paid e e uh, fairly weekly and not get any attention because you don't have a billion dollars. You can't be nobody. Yep. You know, that's that that's the problem. That's my, my, my criticism with the whole situation is it's not fair. And, and I'm making different points in different videos that may seem repetitive, but there's so many different angles to look at this situation right now. It's not really repetitive. It's just there's 10 or 20 things that are messed up about the whole situation. You know, so that, that I, I just think we need to accept in motorsports more critical speaking. It just seems like there's certain things you cannot say. If you say this, you're in trouble. Just like the tracks, just like anything, you're not supposed to say that. Any negative comments will be deleted. What do you mean when you say that, track promoter? If you don't have any negative comments, if the truth's not out in front of everybody, you're not ever going to get an actual solution. You're going to get a BS solution if you just have all positive comments. You need negative comments, comments and positive comments to find a neutral. That's the only way you're going to get there. You've got to have the negativity to even have any logical solution that's going to have a long-term solution. See, I kind of disagree in a sense because I think some of them negative comments, you could go personally to them you know, or, or you know, private message them. You know, versus put it out to the public. I can see forms. where you're saying the the you know, masses. You rile the masses yeah. up. Yes, it's which I is mean, where I, you wanted to talk I, about Trump earlier. That's rile masses. That's what national mainstream media does all the time. Rile masses. Yeah, so I'm not disagreeing with you, but you know, there's no sense blasting it out there. You know, for the whole world to see that. You know, I don't know. Maybe do we all need to grow <coughs> up a little bit and accept that not everybody thinks like we do? Why do we have to well, lose our minds so much when somebody doesn't agree with us in a, in a superior way? Well, Why are you, we losing our emotional minds? I think there's, you know, I think that comes after you've voiced your opinion to them personally. I think the respect of giving them, giving them first shot at trying to right the wrong, you know, you know, if there is a problem, they can address it. You know, if you know, because a lot of times, even track promoters, you know, other drivers, they they know things are wrong whether they'll admit it or not I mean, it's just like that it's, track we had at kilgore's last weekend you 
I thought it was a great racetrack compared to what it had been, and then you had a few others, you know, complaining about it. I mean, <laughs> we're just not ever all going to see it the same, you know? In the heat of the moment, too, Perspective man. is real. I mean, yeah. Back to that, really. The, in the heat of the moment, too, I'll say this, and this is something I've had to learn uh, and still do daily, but if you make a decision based off of your emotions, like in the heat of the moment, if you you know if you if you get a bad call and that night you get right out of your race car and you first thing you do is grab your phone and smash that racetrack that is not the right thing to do I assure you period hands down okay and you may even have to wait I've even had guys come up to me I knew they didn't mean to run over me and make my car look like a gutted catfish but now it does and I knew they didn't mean to and when they come up to me I was not in I didn't want to hear anything they had to say I'm like look best thing is for you to go back to where you came from, and we'll talk about this later. I just need a minute to, to, to gather myself. You know what I'm saying? So this doesn't escalate. I don't want to hear anything. Just, you know, and sometimes as an individual, you have to give people a minute to cool off and just stop that bleeding, slow it down just a minute. You know what I mean? Um, and that's on anything, in my opinion, in life. And you <coughs> are much apt to get a better response out of the other party a lot of times you know, timing is crucial no matter what you're doing. If that promoter's standing up there getting his ass chewed by five different people and he and the lights are freaking going down and the shitter's running over and they're out of hot dogs in the concession stand <laughs> right. and you go, hey, that was not a good start off of four. If I was that promoter, I'd probably climb down out of wherever yeah. I was doing and kick you right in the nuts. That's what I would do. You know what I'm saying? You like it's, promote it's it's overload. You would have done that? He would have done it. He it's would, overload. He would have done it. He's probably done it. Yeah. The but, promoter's got to have thick skin. You know, it's, you know, it's a tough job. You know, they can't do nothing He's sitting right. in a nice chair. That's Flag, how you know he's, he's flagman, a former promoter. Flagmen are the same way. They yeah. catch up beating. You Flagmen know, get it worse than the promoters no, sometimes. They, I'm telling you. Well, there's nights they get it worse. I mean, but, well, they're accessible to the fans. Like, if there's a family the, member in the stands, they can crawl up that. that the, I've seen it. The problem with promoters <laughs> is they're doing their job to the best of their ability. They don't want to go out there and lose money. They're not going out there to fail. You know, they, and 90% they of the time, these track promoters and owners are losing a lot of money. They are. And they, they're working hard to produce something, and sometimes – they do fail. Sometimes they do have a bad track. They're human. But, you know, it's a learning process. You know, we've all made mistakes. We've all do something wrong. But the problem is, you know, if they've got 500 people in the that showed up in the pits, 200 of them people could do that job way better than the track promoter. But yet they ain't taking that risk. You know, it's... Oh, no. But there's so many people out there that can do a better job than the promoter. Well, go do it. You know, but at the end of the day, that guy promoter you know whatever they're they're trying their best to do and you know they may make the wrong decisions yeah but don't talk about how their just, feet stink till you wear their shoes but they're just like us on the racetrack you know we make it we make quick spotty decisions sometimes sometimes we make that decision to go underneath that guy not realizing he's turning down we hit we make contact you know it's it's quick spontaneous decisions that have to be made and sometimes they're wrong so uh what do you think of the talking dirty show any Closing thoughts. What do you think about the inside the dirt? Of course, the show I, got going on this too. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a good deal, man. Anytime you, I think I like what you're doing. I think that uh, you know, just like you said earlier, you need a little bit of debate. You need a little bit of topic. You need to address some things. There's dirt people out there that are going to have different opinions of, of what we have. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I think that's good. I think that that back and forth, that yin and yang, that little bit of friction where there's friction, there's going to be fire. You know, and that's what you're trying to do is get a fire started so people will look and see what's going on. So right. I think it'll be a I think it'll be a damn good deal eventually. IRP race cars, obviously. Uh, you, you're 12 weeks back, you're saying, or yeah, we you know we produce a lot but of. But everybody out there, they're ready to make one today, right? That's what you want them to think. <laughs> that's Call right. That's right. Ready to go. You no, know, we we've been fortunate and blessed to be able to do this. You know, every one of us racers out there, there's a select few across the country that you know I'd say. 30 to 40 racers across the country get to do it for a full-fledged living. You know, most everybody has a behind-the-scenes job somewhere down the line, and that job's got to work with them as far as being able to go out and race. But, you know, throughout the country, there's there's a select few that get to do it for a living. But behind the scenes, just, you know, it's everyday life for us. You know, we got to go to work every day. We got to produce. We got to, you know, make pay our bills and, and make money to be able to get back to the racetrack on the weekends. So... All right, well, I think that's going to do it uh, for myself, Chaz Thompson, Jason Ingles, Patrick Daniel. This was the Talking Dirty Show. Talking and Dirty, boy. We're still looking for that 
presidential invite. Yeah, yeah, what's up with that? Come on, Donnie. We'd like to meet you in person, baby. You did a good job.